in moving into a tiny house, the age-old question is always, where can I park? And there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety that comes with that question and unfortunately keeps a lot of people from pursuing the idea further. So today we're gonna talk about what options are available now for tiny house parking all across the country. As a couple of nomadic tiny house dwellers, we've parked in a myriad of different parking spots. Things like RV parks, uh, people's backyards, uh, RV friendly businesses, like things like Cracker Barrel. And every once in a while, a tiny home community. Mm -hmm. We've even formed a temporary community with friends a time or two. Yep. And during these days, we stayed for one night up to two months at a time. We realize that most of you are probably looking for long-term parking options. And the reality is there are more options available than most realize. Though, <laughs> it does require some amount of legwork to find those spots. And it's important to note that in the United States and Canada and other places in the world, that full-time tiny house living is not allowed most places outside of RV parks. Fortunately, this is beginning to change through tiny friendly laws and zoning. So if you're looking for some tiny house parking options now, more than likely that's why you're here, we are gonna share with you some of the things that are out there. Generally speaking, available tiny house parking spots come in three big categories. Easy and legal, where tiny houses are already allowed for full-time living or long-term parking is allowed. There's convenient and risky, which is parking on someone else's property that's not zoned for tiny houses or RVs. And finally, expensive and limited. And that's tiny house parking on your own property. Okay, so let's dig into each of those categories a little further. If you want hassle-free parking, best bet is to go where it's allowed. And so by that, we mean where movable tiny houses AKA tiny houses on wheels are allowed for full-time living or extended stays. So this will be in tiny home communities, tiny friendly RV parks, and in cities that have tiny friendly zoning. <laughs> in most cities with tiny friendly zoning, it's as ADUs or accessory dwelling units. So that's a tiny house in a backyard. And this is in places like Los Angeles, and many other Californian cities, and also in a few other states too. We'll put a full list in the description below. And if you wanna learn more about ADUs, check out a video we did with our friend Cole. He is the absolute expert on ADUs. To find full-time community parking, check out the ever-growing directory of tiny home communities at searchtinyhousevillages.com. Each listing has notes about legal status and style of community, from tiny friendly RV parks to intentional communities and everything in between. Tiny houses as unpermitted ADUs have historically been the most common parking arrangement. So that's a tiny house on someone else's property, like a backyard or even a farm, but it's not zoned for RVs or tiny houses on wheels. These spots are a convenient way to park where you wanna live or need to live for close proximity to your job or family. These parking spots often cost a lot less than the nearest RV park and are more spacious than your average RV lot. The thing I love about backyard parking is it's just so practical. You're using available land, existing infrastructure, you're sharing resources, and it's a mutually beneficial relationship between the tiny house dweller and the primary homeowner. The rent that you pay for your lot or your spot can go towards the primary homeowner's mortgage, property tax, or even things like a grocery bill. 
Backyards also offer a wonderful opportunity for community. The natural close proximity of a backyard neighbor just lends itself to relationship building and resource sharing, even just sharing a lawnmower. In our current backyard parking spot, we pay $310 a month in rent, and that includes all utilities. We also do some work trade, so for an hourly wage, Alexis and I will do maybe it's some yard work or something around the house, and that money will actually come off our rent. We also enjoy a really friendly relationship with our host, aka landmates, like they called themselves once. <laughs> we chat with them on a regular basis, but we still feel like we have lots of privacy, even though we're in a backyard. We absolutely love our backyard parking spot, but because it's unpermitted, all it takes is one phone call to the code enforcement and we could be booted from this spot. Yeah, one complaint that's completely out of our control to the local code enforcement could result in fees and a notice to move rather quickly, which could be seven days, 14 days. Some people are able to get extensions up to a couple months. The reality is that code enforcement is done on a complaint basis. So that means in most places, code enforcement officers aren't driving through neighborhoods looking for tiny houses or RVs to find. But what it does mean is that these complaints, like we said, that are out of your control, when those happen, it's their job to follow up on those, you know, to see what's going on. That's why it's a good idea for the primary homeowner to go and talk to the neighbors, you know, make sure that everything is copacetic and they're, they're cool with having a tiny house in their neighborhood. This is especially important if the tiny house is visible for any of their properties, but this is also a good opportunity to address any concerns that might come up, like privacy, so you can figure out ways to, to solve those issues. So if you're thinking about going into one of these risky but super convenient backyard parking situations, uh, you can look for more secure <laughs> under the radar spots. So this would be in neighborhoods where you can tell that people are living in RVs or tiny houses. Um, it could be neighborhoods with no HOAs. Or it could also be on a property where the tiny house is going to be completely tucked away and not visible from the surrounding properties. Remember, if you're parked in an unpermitted spot, one of the main things you should do is be a good neighbor because you are now an ambassador to the tiny house world. Uh, so, and this might be the first time neighbors have ever seen one. So be responsible, be respectful. Absolutely. No late night parties. Unless the neighbors are coming over, then that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you're probably wondering, how do you find these risky, convenient backyard parking spots? Good question. <laughs> Well, in the past, for us, we found a lot of spots through networking with friends and family or through tiny house meetup groups. Uh, and more recently, we've used Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace targeting uh, neighborhood swap trade groups. And in those posts, we put up an ad <laughs> basically about us and our tiny house saying a little bit about us, what our parking needs are and what we're willing to offer as far as rent or uh, partial work trade. Yeah, everybody knows Facebook. So if you put something on Facebook, understand there's gonna be some haters. Yes, um, in our last parking search, uh, we got some negative comments, uh, people being like, why would you be doing this? This isn't allowed, this isn't legal. One lady even complained, she said the vacancy rate is so low in the city, you know, I can't believe you're doing this. What I did in, in, to respond to these folks was I always responded in a kind, in a straightforward way. And to the vacancy point, I thought, well, we're not actually taking any available housing away from anyone else. We're asking for someone to lend us part of their property so we could park our home on it. And the result of responding um, in this way to people is some of the folks actually came back and said something nice. And then we got several DMs from people um, who admired the way that we handled ourselves and also offered parking. Um, so we got several parking spots offers, which was fabulous because once we had several offers, now we can move into vetting them. 
And the way we vet parking offers, uh, of course we say thank you right away for your willingness to host us, absolutely. But the first thing you do is you schedule a meeting so you can go see the spot. And the reason you wanna go check out that piece of property is because if you can't get the tiny house back there, there's no reason to talk any further. So you really wanna go check it out and make sure the house will fit. Right, and look for things like low hanging branches, mm -hmm. low hanging electrical lines and that sort of thing. The next probably most important criteria is how is the communication with the property owners? Um, do you get along? Are there any red flags? Um, you know, communication red flags. Yeah, keep an eye out for that, please. <laughs> this is going to be really important to how you're able to um, solve conflict and to communicate, you know, clear expectations from both parties moving forward. And, and third, um, what's your dream criteria? Where in the town do you want to be close to? Um, do you want to have room for a garden? So these are the kinds of things you want to look for when you go check out a property. Yes, it's great that someone offered you a spot, but you got some work to do before you can say yes. We know a lot of you guys want to park a tiny house on your own land. We totally get it. We understand. But you do have to realize this can be tough and expensive. To park a tiny house on your own land, the property most likely needs to be unrestricted which means it has no zoning or building code rules, but sanitation rules are still gonna apply. That's pretty much anywhere. Also, even if the parcel of land itself is affordable, the development costs are gonna add up quickly. So if this is a raw piece of land, you are definitely gonna have to run power and water and sewer to it. So, and these are a major expense. So you're going to have to pay to bring power onto the property or create your own, which is going to require money too, because you're going to have to buy a solar power system that's going to meet your needs. And for water, if city water is not available, which you'll have to pay to hook that up, you're going to need to either dig a well or to have water delivery into a storage uh, setup. For most unrestricted property, you're going to be required to have a septic system. So these can run from $5,000 and up. And most people don't even think uh, about preparing the property. I mean, if it has trees, you have to cut down trees, pull out stumps, prepare the dirt and tamp and put gravel down. And that's just to get the tiny house on. So keep in mind all of these things when dealing with a piece of raw land. All these necessary development costs on top of the land costs is actually the true total amount you're gonna to need to spend. And it isn't cheap. There is a less involved way of owning property. You could buy a traditional house, park the tiny house and live in it in the backyard and rent out the main house. Of course, you need to be able to afford the mortgage initially, but hey, it's an option. Mm -hmm. Uh, another approach is to get a temporary permit for an RV or tiny house on your property while you build a traditional foundation-based home. So the house is going to be here. Uh, it's uh, about 75 feet long and it's from about here to the driveway there. This typically is a six to 12 month time frame, but we know a few crafty homeowners who've stretched this out over a few to several years. As you save up to buy property in the future, there are ways to enjoy land ownership perks without the actual ownership. And that would be parking in places with room to spread out where you have more privacy and more room for things like homesteading activities. And this would be like on somebody's farm or ranch or large estate acreage like our friend Ariel. If you'd like to learn more about Ariel and her off-grid parking spot on a 12,000 acre estate, check it out in the link below. We really hope
hope you found this video helpful in learning more about what tiny house parking options are available today. And we encourage you all to really think about what you're comfortable with. You know, for some of you, the risk of an unpermitted situation is just not gonna work, and I get that. And so I really encourage you to check out the resources that we've put in our description about looking for those easy legal spots in tiny home communities and in cities that have passed tiny house friendly zoning. And get involved if you want to create more change and you can learn about how to do that in our documentary series living tiny legally thank you guys so much for watching and best wishes on finding your tiny house parking spot we'll see you guys next time bye bye guys for watching our video and for stopping by tiny house expedition i'm alexis and i'm christian don't forget to like comment and subscribe and for more tiny home tours and stories click the videos below and join us on patreon for bonus content including face-to-face -face conversations with us <laughs> we hope to see you there all right thanks guys have a good one